Our presentation today uh, is called Gun in 60 Frames, <clears throat> and that's related to the short formats we produce here at the Marmalade. Um, let's click through that. Let's see what happens. Ah, introduction. We got that. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Torsten. <coughs> um, we had a brief speech about the Marmalade, and then we will go to our uh, presentation where we took one job as an example to explain how we do things here procedurally in Houdini. So, I'm Manuel. <laughs> I'm Manuel. Um, I'm here at the Marmalade for nearly 20 years. Next year it will be that. And uh, the fun thing to work here is that the company reinvents itself every two to three years. So um, I started out as a 3D artist. And right now I'm leading the CGI department, doing direction, talking to clients, etc., etc. To find out what uh, the cool guys like Micha can do. Hello guys, I'm Michael, or Michael. Um, I'm TD here and uh, also responsible for most of the stuff that's moving, so you could call me uh, the lead animation artist. Thank you very much for the applause from you guys. Uh, we take it. <laughs> we know that you see what we did there. And um, yeah, that was a nice little voyage through the stuff we do here uh, with our CGI department. Uh, people may have spotted there are real shots in there too, because it's part of what we do. And we will try to always combine uh, CGI and live action shooting to go to a certain quality standard, which was established back in the days when we started shooting stuff. So we have to keep up with that. Um, and uh, yeah, the project this is about was also seen in its final form uh, in the showreel. And it was a demo for Nutella Be Ready. Um, I don't know if anyone knows the product. And they had a demo prior coming to us, which looked like that and uh, wanted us to improve on it. <laughs> they had that, it worked, but they needed more drama, more spectacular images, the whole shebang. It's uh, an update, more interesting, more engaging. And uh, so basically, we did the same thing all over again in a more engaging way. Presented storyboards. Oh, I'm getting ahead of the presentation, sorry. This is our first. So they wanted us to improve on this old demo, increase the taste appeal, increase indulgence, which is a very important word for them. I don't really know what it means. 
it's like you got to see what's in there and nice to feel great. Add the marmalade touch, we'll make it look nice and um, shoot as much as possible for maximum realism. <coughs> because of course clients in this world, in the food world especially, uh, very often make bad experiences with the CGI work. It's not tasty, it's not where it needs to be. So they want to shoot also their real ingredients, which most often we do not in the case of Nutella. Actually, we did, but um, that's their philosophy. So, okay, we went in there and started production with the basic stuff, the product. These were references we got which were meant to be too perfect, or let's say too illustrated. It was about the airiness of this thing, because of course if you bite into the waffle, blah blah blah, it's super crunchy, airy, and whatnot. You need to recognize the Nutella N, and uh, the edge break has to be a certain way. This is the law. Here are some examples of reality. <coughs> <laughs> Which quite nicely illustrate uh, the challenge that we have when they come to us with their products and say, we need amazing imagery. And then you're like, well, okay, yes, uh, we will have to build dummies for real, bigger size, whatever, or maybe go CGI. And um, then we aligned on elements which can be a bit broken, but not too much, reaching the perfect, imperfect, be ready bar. Let's call it that. And you can see, well, it's about idealization of reality. And to find something that looks more photoreal than uh, the usual package illustrations. <laughs> and how we did that, Michael will tell you something about it. Yes, this was all like the theoretical idea behind our film and now I will show you a bit of our workflows, how we built everything, moved everything and made it look nice. And um, at first for the asset creation, we heavily relied on uh, VDB modeling techniques um, because it's ideal for organic shapes and obviously this is a food product, so um, it's organic. Um, so edge flow doesn't really matter. <clears throat> Also, as you can see in this baguette kind of shape, you have a combination of sharp edge, uh, sharp, sharp shapes and uh, rounded shapes. So um, we needed some sort of Boolean um, method that holds up for high res geometry. And um, also as client uh, changes its mind, uh, it's always for us important to stay uh, procedural regarding, for example, in this case, the, the thickness of the wafer, how many pores you see, um, how many imperfections, and uh, what the breaking edge looks like. And also the benefit with uh, VDB modeling that gives us is that we can instantly create different resolutions of the mesh for animation purposes or for like um, real-time playback and whatnot. So at first we started with the good old reference images and um, set it up. And these are very photographs that we uh, took ourselves. Then I start with a simple sphere, sphere and um, split it left and right to some lattice shaping. And we do it with the lattice so um, we can alter the resolution afterwards if needed. Then we bridge those two halves together, some additional lattice tweaking. And what's he doing now? Now we're uh, building the, the lower uh, part of it. Also, no direct modeling was involved. It's all procedural. So if I change anything up, upstairs of the node graph, um, everything will um, went down, will go down. And um, this is the, the end that we uh, trace from the logo. It was hand placed to where it needs to be right on top of the, the round shape, little extrusion, and then gets converted into VDB, as well as the base bread, or the base B ready. And next up, I'm building some geometry to take out those big chunks to um, create these gaps. And here you can see what I was, what I was, what I was meaning with um, 
solid Boolean methods because if you're working with high-risk geometry, Booleans tend to be very slow. So um, we go, we went for uh, VDB modeling. This now has to compute a while. Um, at this stage, I'm building the inside of it, so I can later sub subtract it out of the uh, out of the be ready. And this is the one point where we can stay procedural and change anything um, later on, because um, the more I erode this shape, the more thick or thin uh, the hull of the wafer is going to be. And then some additional subtraction of the inside chamber, so to speak. Then everything gets combined. A little bit smooth, so everything looks like it's one piece. And then I split it into top and bottom half. And we're done with the base shape. Oh no, of course we have to take out the chambers from the inside. Amazing. So next up, the airiness. For that, um, uh, we created different uh, geometries to scatter points on. On these points, then uh, we copy to point some um, deformed spheres, and we make big spheres and small spheres for the natural irregularity, as we call it. Exactly. All those get then combined and also converted into a VDB. As you can see, this is all VDB and some additional very small pores at the outer uh, edge of the, the be ready. And this then gets also subtracted from the base thing for upper and lower part. And I guess, yeah, I'm going to do it now. Um, and then we uh, create even more natural, natural irregularities. And um, extracting the sharp corners of the object, um, creating some noisy meshes that also get converted into VDB and then subtracted from the main thing. So this is before any imperfections. And this is with imperfections. Nice. <clears throat> it was uh, actually really helpful to have this workflow on that one because the little thingies on the N, they feed back on this up until the very end. Exactly, and that's the, the, the main reason why we want to stay as procedural as possible the whole way through. Next up, we defined uh, the breaking edge. Also, This was also a point where we did many iterations, how high up can the breaking can be, um, shall it be through the end or below the end or in the middle of the thing? And um, so, um, yeah, I'm just building a base curve, which was hand drawn, building some cutting geometry and also utilizing. Oh no, here I'm making some cutting geometries for some major crumbs. And I'm subtracting this. And also, then I'm fracturing the, the tip of it and the main body. And now that we have a very flat edge, of course, the pores, the airiness needs to be applied there too. So same technique as before, scatter some points and put on some spheres, big and small. And also get subtracted from the main thing. And we're done with the base modeling. Yeah, next up is uh, when we had our uh, base model, we could start uh, with the previous. Back to you. <clears throat> right. The previous, actually, this jumps a bit back and forth. We never intended to do what uh, Michael just told. We thought we were going to shoot a movie. So we did a previous and shots, which were based on the approach of having a, a film which we, which we can cut together, not have a one shot. <coughs> That's the animatic for that. And it came out quite boring. 
it's more or less the same thing they had before. It's not really, hmm, hmm, where's the improvement? Where's the improvement? Where's the wow? That's not what we need. <coughs> no dynamism, no indulgence at all. So when they were, okay, cool, then we will do an immersive camera move, one shot, all, all everything we could do. And, um, oh yeah, well, that's, that's one from the past. <coughs> um, we like to animate procedurally also, meaning that um, we, we animate any, everything in a, in a given range on a slider, and this comes from Soft Image actually, back from the days, where we could link anything to a slider, a parameter, which was floating, and then say, okay, zero is the parameter, the animation is here, one is the parameter, and the animation is done. And to then go in and make cool camera rampings, dynamic images, was very easy because we had a motion control scene and everything was happening and we could say, okay, ease in, ease out, hold, etc., etc. So that's uh, something we still love to do. And then we went on doing variations for them to find out what is dynamism, indulgence, etc. Yeah, so this was this these were our first drafts, like different techniques and mechanics we came up that um are interesting to look at. Also you can see here, which because this will change later, we thought in the beginning that the chocolate chamber were filled into the top half of it and not the bottom one. They are. <laughs> but the client wanted us to do it differently. So after those drafts we did some more drafts. And here you can see that already we have some ver versions where the chocolate is in the low lower bottom. And of course, this goes back and forth in-house. And uh, if we like it, then we send it out to the client. And then client decided to go for this route, more or less. So we got a winner. But after the previous is before the animation, so of course this needed a lot of tweaks until we got to that point. I think this is version 47, which is still quite okay, I guess. Yeah, we had more. The worst thing is to do a droplet falling. Um, this can reach up into the hundreds of versions. Um, here it made more sense to do variations because it was how many of the tiny thingies do we see, where, how big is what, uh, how does the, the chocolate and the breaking look. So there were many details. Also, legal department always chimes in and says, yeah, we like that, but <clears throat> there are too many of these balls. We don't have as many balls in there, which was especially important for uh, the breaking moment coming up. It was like, this is too little, this is too many. There are too much pieces. This is way too much. Uh, no, we don't like that. Maybe let's go to this one, which is close to the first one. Um, commercials, the usual stuff. All right, yeah. You go. Oh, okay, that's me. <laughs> uh, by the way, that's the first time we do this here. Uh, we didn't rehearse, so uh, bear with us. <laughs> <clears throat> so um, at this point, we did something which we can do here, is to say, okay, um, to get alignment and reassurance on client side and to educate ourselves about how this, how do this look? What, what is it, what we're doing here? Not having an old demo, which we need to make look better, but really study what's, what's the product. Um, we did a reference shoot here. So we had a dummy of the thing, we filled it with chocolate, we put lights on it, did camera moves uh, with the help of our SFX and uh, a real DOP lighting, etc., etc. And the food styling, styling the little swirl, because these, of course, are also very feedback intensive. And we ended up with this. And kind of simulated uh, movements, uh, which we will do to see how it does this look in camera. And I personally already see things here where I say, well, yeah, it might look real because it's in camera, but the wafer looks like crap. When you see the real wafer dummy, it's like a piece of styrofoam. And um, 
the chocolate itself usually has also lots of problems. Too reflective, not reflective enough. Let's show three different light passes, paint them all together. All of that became already quite obvious to us when we did these tests, but we had good detailed shots on how does the structure of Nutella look in a close-up. The ritual or the ritual is it's a vision, eh? Yeah. And uh, how do they like their ritual? And then we went to animation. And full disclaimer, no solvers were harmed in the making of this motion picture. So if you came here for nice chocolate or Nutella spread simulation, um, sorry, we, we didn't solve or simulate anything. But why did we do that? Um, or it, for what parts did we uh, use uh, the procedural animation rather than uh, any simulation? And we used it for the flying crisps. There are these balls coming down there. We used it for the pouring, so the, the chocolate snake laying down, and the tearing, as well as the little crumbs flying away. Yeah, so um, one thing I like to do, um, if we have to animate several pieces of, of one thing, so to speak, is that we only um, make one animation curve, which has the perfect timing, and then I offset them per point uh, via a little uh, vex, vex trick. Um, also, yeah, what you can see here is that uh, we made a base path and the base animation along those paths. And then I uh, apply the delay along the um, local x-axis. Um, so I could say the, the first pi the pieces closer to the camera start uh, uh, falling down earlier than the other ones. And all this is tweakable and uh, live. So we can um, perfectly synchronize the camera move um, with the falling crisps. Yeah, this is what happens here. And um, to do so, is, uh, I'm using, uh, yeah, this is quite technical, but um, for the, 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 to do so, I could uh, uh, use the second um, argument of the second parameter of the channel function in VEX, which uh, takes in, in a time. And this hasn't, doesn't have to be the, the time that's running uh, in your play bar, but it could be any time and uh, randomized and applied uh, with an offset. And this is um, how, we can, how we can just animate one thing and uh, apply it with a time offset to a lot of things. So no copy stamping or for eaching needed. Yeah, so next up, the Nutella pouring. Why didn't we simulate that? Because obviously you could simulate uh, a viscous fluid like this. Um, but what we need, as we already told our clients, need exactly what they are asking for, obviously. And if you simulate stuff, you're, you lose a bit control and we need full control over the final shape of the, uh, of the chamber filled and also full control over the timing. When is something close to the camera and when, start, when does it start, when does it stop? And also for shading, um, we needed proper UVs, which is also for fluids um, always kind of a hassle. And yeah, the chambers were built basically from a spiral, which I then fitted into each chamber. I hand drawn the outline of the chamber. And each spiral was then fitted into the chamber. I could apply for each chamber if the spiral was this way around or this way around. Um, and also everything, of course, is procedural, so we can change the amount of, of swirls and um, how many distances be, uh, be, uh, between each, each of the, the curves, so to speak, and yeah, some procedural shaping for the height along the curve. And for the settling, which you can see here, so as you can see, as a base, I just used, obviously, a curve, and um, I do the same trick here. We we made uh, like we we timed the, the the speed of the falling down, and then I offset it, it offset it 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 it, it <laughs> along the curve um, by its own u value. And uh, here's a um, simplified example of doing this by a line. And um, 
Yeah, so this is the basic principle of, of the pouring. It's a straight line before, and I just uh, move every point up and uh, clamp the position along the curve as well, so we get this pouring motion, and then some additional shaping to get the right bendiness, because also this was uh, very crucial for us to get the perfect shape of the, the bulge before it uh, lays down. So next up, when, after we were done with uh, the animated curves, um, we just, uh, I just created uh, two kind of uh, sweeped curves of it. One for the f uh, shape well, when it's in the air, before it's settled, which looked like this, and one where the shape is settled. And um, as you can see, it doesn't look so nice at the falling part, but it just gets blended because what the... Uh, what the procedural animation setup provides me with the curves is that I know for each point along the curve uh, what it, it local uh, progress is. So I can uh, I can define this is still flying, this just arrived, and this is uh, the settled motion. So I can use this information for mask for shading. So um, you would um, uh, you would have a mask that. Uh, uh, so that the, the flying chocolate is a bit more shiny and the settled chocolate is a bit more rough and uh, all this uh, can be provided by this procedural um, animation. And also doing it with a sweep, um, we have automatically nice UVs along the, along the whole uh, tube and um, I could use, could use this UVs then later to uh, apply some some noises here. I add the dents and the bulges from the flying crisps, and after this, I put um put on some noises along the curve to give it some extra detail. Um, questions? Uh, there will be room for questions afterwards. So please, is it? <laughs> more or less the same time than you did. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> That's why we said no question during the presentation, right? <laughs> but uh, we'll keep it in mind and make a page insert poop joke here. The client will love it. <laughs> so, yeah, next up, um, we add this Ricciolos. Re the little nozzles at the end of it. And um, this is also something that uh, changed during the process because when we started animating, it was like every chamber needs to be filled. Then it was only the first chamber needs to be filled or only the second, only the third, or only the first and the second. And um, so um, the, the, this setup was uh, meant to be that so we can uh, make every chamber uh, be filled or not, it doesn't matter. So, um, but thankfully, um, we only had to animate the, the one of the chambers so we could add an ec extra reach law and didn't have to um, figure out a way how to put the perfect nozzle on top of the of the uh, pouring. Um, yeah, after those are applied, uh, everything gets again converted into VDBs. We like VDBs. Everything is smoothed and merged together and uh, the base wafer is uh, subtracted obviously. Ta -ta -ta. Faster. And we add some additional bulges via a simple softy form. Then I'm doing an attribute transfer. Um, but I'm to transfer just the UVs. And um, one thing I, I experienced is that I'd rather for that kind of simple transfers where I don't care about um, sampling a lot of points from my target uh, for, from a source geometry. I just use a, a simple uh, VEX function called XYZ dist um, because um, it's much faster for um, high resolution geometry. One thing though, one problem we encountered with, uh, with the UVs and then uh, a combined VDME mesh is at the areas where where two parts of the of the tube intersected, there obviously were uh, visible UV seams, and um, let me jump back to there. 
The way we fixed it was that we created the mask at those intersections so we could later in, uh, in the rendering stop it. Stop it. Um, we could then use those masks uh, to, to uh, texture the whole thing with the proper texture, but in these areas we used, I guess, triplanar texturing um, where proper UVs wouldn't matter. All right, so next up, the tiering, or anything you want to add? No, okay. Next up, the tiering, same thing here. Why didn't we simulate? Because we need full control over the shape, full control of the timing, and also nice UVs so we can apply nice structures in the shading process later. Yeah, and if you look closely, you can see a face. It's good how we felt at that stage in time. You know Calimero? Yeah, so how, how, uh, how did I do that? I uh, built a bunch of curves, connected each end to the two halves, breaking apart. Then, yeah, okay, come on, get on with it. And then some resampling to have some smooth curves. And also what I needed was uh, one center curve um, from which I could then measure the, the, the progress of the breaking, like how stretched will this curve be? So I can later apply this information to, uh, to this bunch of graphs to do this shaping. You can see it's all a custom deformer, so to speak, um, where we can say, okay, uh, what's the fall off? At what point is it gonna compress? And uh, yeah, what's the shape of the, the whole thing? Um, yeah, and also, of course, th these curves needed to, to split at one point. So what I did is um, I rebuilt every curve two times from each end and defined a threshold at what, at what maximum stretch um, it will just uh, be constrained to a certain length. And um, then I put some additional, I use kin effects. We don't do any character animation, but we, we still like uh, kin effects and uh, 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 what's it called, the uh, rig attribute wrangle to bend curves, it's a nice way. Then the final, uh, final steps for the tiering were to um, apply a little bendy bend for the part for extra gravity, which I used from the, the base curves where I did the same thing, like I, I split it in half and um, applied a curve, uh, applied a curl and yeah, this is just for preview purposes, how it could look. I just uh, put some points on the curves. And then, again, VDB, 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 VDB. Eroding stuff, dilating stuff, smoothing stuff to have a nice, liquidy surface. And again, applying the, uh, the dents of the, the crisps, which uh, live in there. And for the UVs, I um, extracted, or I just used the, the base points of uh, or the root points of the curves, um, used a triangle, a triangulate 2D, I guess. So I, I could then extract only the outer points, uh, which I then, with a for each uh, node, sweep, so to speak, uh, along all of those curves, which then got me a bit further, if he could click faster, please. That was a late light recording. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, which I got then, I could like adjust like how many iteration or like how many steps I wanna have along the curves. This was then all skinned and had proper and nice UVs, which could be then used for shading. These get, then also get applied via uh, attribute transfer, some UV blurring, I guess. Uh, yeah. And next part is for you. Ah, is it? Great. Uh, so social media came into our world with a bunch of new formats. So um, when I started out, uh, we did PAL, but not full PAL, it was squeezed. 
um, and then came 16 by 9 and then full HD and then suddenly they came up with an, ah yeah, and we need this film in 16 by 9 and 9 by 16, I suppose. I'm telling no news to anyone here. And uh, so um, we developed a kind of camera setup, uh, rig is maybe a bit much, uh, but it's a camera setup where we can always evaluate all formats while working on a, on a, on a 16 by 9, which is our master, and then generate from this automatically uh, every framing for presentation of social media formats and rendering in a bigger frame where everything is in uh, so we can happily crop away when the time has come for that. Yeah, which means we only render the whole sequence once and only have to comp it once. Of course, with a bit overhead, but uh, we then just have to crop it after everything is done. So we have five movies uh, with, our, uh, with rendering only one time. Yeah, so this is then what you already saw, but again, the final previous. That led us to be allowed to start rendering. Exactly, that was it. We got a picture lock and could start rendering. Yay! So far, um, we are not going to much into detail how, how we uh, made it look so nice. Just a glimpse at our um, tiny, uh, modest uh, pipeline. We have, for example, our own um, file loader, which has a built in version up and down buttons and latest, and it just goes up to or down to the versions that or, uh, or really exist. It's not just a stupid counter up and down. I think that's quite nice. And so this is the way how we exchange uh, geometry. We use uh, Houdini's BGUSC. Um, if we do something like the crumbs, we would not export the whole crumbs with everything. We would only export the crumb instance base geo and only the points because it makes the uh, export uh, process super fast and then we just uh, do a live copy to point in the render setup which also gives the uh, ability to the render artist that he can he or she can uh, tweak the instances before they get copied onto the uh, onto the the points and um, so this, so stuff doesn't need to happen per frame and what we also do to transfer cameras and object transformations uh, is uh, that we utilize chops for that. So we fetch everything in world space and write out a B-clip file, which then gets loaded into the render scene. And so we, with the same um, method of uh, version up, down, latest, um, so we can always propagate the animation from animation department to render department. And also um, another advantage for procedural modeling everything and uh, like like you saw before like where do we have big pores and where we have small pores we can of course then use those source spheres that we used to subtract from the base mesh as uh, uh, as sources for uh, different masks as you can see here and uh, which then could be fed into the shader to enhance certain features of the wafer and also a nice side effect, <laughs> a nice side effect um, of our real shot, a shoot that we did uh, with a proper DOP was that we could take a proper HDR and uh, of course use this for rendering together with some extra nice lights, obviously. And yeah, Marmalade Pro tip, uh, if you're shooting um, high speed stuff with very hot and bright lights, uh, do it very quickly, plus, cause else uh, your HDR camera will melt. Been there, done that. Yeah, this is like a little contact sheet of uh, the, the layer we um, applied for compositing. I mean, it's in this case at least pretty basic stuff. Um, a lot of ID matties, some extra ref reflections, and yeah, to to hand over uh, as much control as possible uh, to compositing to, um, yeah. Let them finish it. Yes. Let them finish it so that they have everything they need to actually really react to, to any client comment that can come up down this line. Oh yeah, final piece, there we go. It's 
done. It's finished. Applause. <laughs>